Three, two, one. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad with The Magic Brad Show, and I have a guest on, and this is exciting because we get along. We understand. <laughs> His name is Alex. You there, Alex? Yeah, I'm here. And the last name is Meyerhofer. I can read it right there. That's a long one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so when I do these interviews, I keep them kind of condensed so that people can, you know, come, they can kind of take it in all in uh, enough time. They don't have to read the, watch these like two hour webinars. It keeps kind of condensed. So the first thing is, where do you reside? Where are you headquartered? Well, the business and as well as our um, house is in a place called Escondido, which is a little bit north of San Diego, sure. in, in the northern part of San Diego County. Where it's sunny. I lived out there for a yeah, It's years. sunny, yeah, exactly. It's actually <laughs> sunny. <laughs> Yes, and the mountains, and uh, my, I got a friend that lives out there. He likes it. He used to live here. He says, I'll never go back to Minnesota. It's too cold. He says, if I want snow, I just drive up to the mountains. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you married and got kids then too? Yeah, I'm married. Um, kids, yeah. My daughter is like above 30, so I, I don't know. I mean, she's still my little girl, but... <laughs> Well, I don't have any kids, so I know that, uh, that my wife's got one, and we know that, it, that there's no owner's manual for being a parent, you know? You just got to kind of navigate. No, that's it. definitely true, and I very vividly remember when, when our daughter was born, it was a little bit, I don't know, I guess it has to do with who you're hanging out with, so it seemed like, um, you know, everybody in our kind of circle uh, started having babies, and we, actually, my wife and I stopped talking about or telling anybody about our daughter because everybody was, I can't get sleep and they're constantly puking and this and that. And we must have made the perfect baby. She slept in after four weeks, right? like four weeks old, sleep through every night, never had any kind of health issues. Nice. Never, and, and that kept going like that. So we very rarely really could talk about her, even though we're super proud of her. <laughs> and then obviously, you know, if we tell them, how easy we have it with our daughter, they would always say, yeah, it's not it fair. It must, uh, must be in the flow, you know, you got to be in the right stream, otherwise you're paddling uphill, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we are also, we, like you said, you know, everybody does it a little differently, but we always felt, you know, it's a human being, you know, all this kind of weirdo stuff that some people do for the first, like, what, couple of years and then have to make it into a human being. We never did that. And maybe that had something to do with it. Yeah, um, the, the, the deal is there, it's, it's a third entity and it's got its own, the person has its own personality and you know, you gotta kind of let it go the way that it wants to go. So, yeah, yeah, exactly, like exactly. And we were just lucky, I guess, you know, so. Well, let's segue into the whole money thing. What, what is it that you do? Can you summarize it in a sentence or two? How do you help people? Yeah, I like, I mean, I started out doing it for myself, but what I like to help people with right now is what I call reaching the time freedom point, which I define as the point in the future at which your passive income is high enough to pay for all your expenses and you have the freedom to do with your time what you want. Exactly. If, you're, if your income, recurring income, matches your, in, your recur, recurring outgo by $1, you're financially free. Yeah, exactly. Right. So some people complicate it. And I, I think about this a lot. I've been in business all my life and I like the concept of, of uh, having something that's coming in because I got things that are going out. You know, you got your cell phone bill, you got your rent, you got to put money in the, the food on the table. So that uh, stuff goes out, so you got to figure it out. And some people get into this, um, what I got to do is I work a job, an hourly job, and then I got to make as much money as I possibly can. So I get a really good job, so I get paid a lot per hour. But still, there's a limitation because there's only 24 hours in a day and your boss is only going to be able to pay you so much. So there's a limitation there, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's definitely one thing, but there's also a strong dependency there, right? You need to basically convince somebody that what you have to offer as an employee or even in, as a business owner, that that is something of value that they are willing to give you money for. Right. And part of this passive income aspect that, that I first started on my own and now it's through Idea Wealth Grow I offer to other people is to say, okay, if you go to the very fundamental things where the question is not, will that need arise? Is this something that we need? I saw one of your videos, you said, I still have an older iPhone because it does everything that I needed to do, right? So 
why would you need to have iPhone 10 or 11 or 12 or so forth if iPhone 6 does everything for you that you need? But there are certain things where the question of need doesn't go away, right? We all need that we need to have a certain amount of, of beverages, whether it's water or any kind of other one to hydrate ourselves. We need a certain amount of food. We need a certain way to shelter ourselves, our family lives somewhere. Right. And there are a few others, but those are some of the very fundamental ones where I think we could all agree we don't really need to challenge is that need there or not? Can it come? Can it go? Is it fluctuating? No, that need is there. And so when I say to the people we work with, the passive income that we want to create to get to this freedom or time freedom point should come from something that never goes away. And that's why I'm always promoting to say, let's buy single family homes. <laughs> Because that is a need that will always be there and make it a nice home so people see the value in renting it from us. And that generates the income and it can generate the income as like history has proven basically forever. You know? And so then you don't have the situation that there's an economic downturn or whatever it may be, some weird virus popping up or something. And you no longer know if this dependency of somebody giving you money for your time continues or not well i've um it's a mindset thing sometimes people think well i just work a better job and there's all these um benefits that the company gives you and all that so you can kind of justify all of that but the reality is as an employee you're basically selling your knowledge wisdom and experience to someone at a at a wholesale price so they can resell it at retail to make a profit yeah, so absolutely. I know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, and it's a perfect term because I actually had the same realization and, and it's maybe a little trade of, a trade of my personality. I thought, well, it's not just uh, Brad and Axel know this. Maybe other people should know about it too. So there is actually a free, what I call a free mindset manual on the Idea Wealth Grower website where what I basically wanted to explore and help people to overcome is the determination, am I in the victim role? Where life happens to me and I'm basically absorbing it and trying to somehow navigate my way through it, hopefully getting to retirement age, or can I be the creator right. of my life and the path that I choose and the investments that I make and so forth and so forth. And the mindset manual basically says, let's first find out where you are. Then let's introduce you to a, mod to a model that helps you to kind of like get going on changing from if you find you're in a victim role to become a creator and if you find yourself as a budding creator how to get better at it and then work together potentially i mean the manual ultimately says here are the steps and then you can make the decision do i want to you know call or make an appointment with axel or do i find somebody else who can help me to use my creative um, energy to make something positive out of it and for me i'm always saying well if you take part of it to handle your money then you can have the freedom to do all the things you're passionate about because you don't need to worry about money anymore. Exactly. And it is a mindset thing. It kind of releases all that uh, negativity yeah, exactly. of, oh, I got bills to pay. I got it. What, what if I get sick? And you start your monkey mind starts thinking about the stuff that could happen. But if you have these uh, basically money working for you rather than you working for your money, you yeah. can kind of be free to think of different ideas and things. And I think it's a great idea because I was in, I still am in the event industry. And I thought this is going to be good events, hospitality, travel, and tourism. People are always going to want to do that. And then COVID came along and said, you can't do that. So I thought, well, what's, what's more yeah. secure, you know, real yeah. estate is secure. That's true. Yeah. Although, I mean, it's kind of funny because when, when we made the booking, I actually had to think about it because I saw that on your website. Because you asked me about kids, right? And my daughter, not being so little anymore, is actually the owner or co-owner of an event management company. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I said to her when she said, Dad, what do I do with this pandemic thing? And I said, if you can make it in a pandemic, you can make it anytime. And they're actually doing pretty well. Um, actually, a lot of people in the event industry are doing better than they were before because they, they had to make the pivot and they got out of their local in the local marketing and they've expanded it globally and they're doing a lot more zoom type of activities like this so a lot of people yeah, are and that i think that one of the differentiators in general not just in the event industry i think this is probably true for people like you and me as business owners and in, in, in even for people in, in employment situations when you can demonstrate 
that you have a certain level of agility and you are able to transition and transform your circumstances, then I guess you will always be reasonably successful. It's just the people who constantly hesitate and really struggle with change that ultimately get into this victim mindset that we touched on earlier. Let's talk a little bit about um, the real estate element, because I know a lot of people with the mindset, they think, oh my God, I don't want to buy another house. That's going to be too expensive. And then I'll go off to fix the toilet and I'm going to have to you know, mow the lawn for them. I'm going to have to go over there and pick up dog poop in the yard. I don't want to do all that stuff. How am I going to invest in real estate? So that's yeah. sort of a, 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 a in a box type mindset. Um, I don't own any property, but I'm invested in REITs, which is real estate investment trusts. Yes. And it's doing very good for me because it's very diversified and real estate, it can have its dips, but you have to have a place to sleep. Maslow said so. You need security. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally with you and Maslow. And that's why I mentioned these fundamental needs at the beginning, which is yeah. kind of at the bottom ring of that pyramid or that hierarchy. Um, so that the real estate investing, I would say these concerns that you just voiced are pretty common. And I think sometimes recently got more drummed up than, than they probably were before. My answer to that, or the answer that I try to, to help other people realize is there is a model called turnkey investing that we are pro, um, promoting and that we are actually encouraging people to do. And what that means is the first part is to say, where do I live and how well do properties in my area perform? And performance means what's the ratio between the price of the property and how much I get out of it. So a simple example, if I had a $100,000 property, good performance would be $1,000 a month in rent or 1%. Now, if I take my area here where I live in the San Diego area, the reasonable starting point for a nice like three bedroom house is like in the 600,000 area. So if you think that through for that same level of performance, I would have to find somebody who's willing to pay me $6,000 in rent per month. That's pretty much impossible. What is doable is maybe three or 2,500 or something. So the performance would be half. So what do we do? We say, okay, when we live in an area where we find out that the properties don't perform, we need to go out of state. And then the question becomes, well, how do I do that when I don't live anywhere near my property? And that's where the term turnkey comes in. There's all kinds of uh, organizations out there that offer the way to invest in real estate. And I believe the, the best model for out of state is turnkey, but with a little caveat. And that's what I teach my, my um, mentoring clients all the time, is you need to find, and we have, and we refer actually our clients to those turnkey providers who find what I call the ugly duckling in the neighborhood they do the renovation with their own team. They actually figure out what is a fair price. So they bought it for something, they make a little profit and they sell it to me because the fair price is also the price that the property appraises at when it's actually finished so I can finance it. And, and this is the really important part, they are also the same entity that managed that property after I bought it. And the reason why that's so important is because when not only do they know everything that they did to the property in the per process of renovating it, but when you think about and we use the term mindset, and it's perfect that you brought that up, uh, Brad, it's if I know that I put in the, the appliances, the ceiling fans, the wards, and all the moving parts, the water heater, air conditioning, you name it, and I'm the one who also has to fix it if it breaks, I go about it differently yeah. And if you know, I just need to fix this thing up to the satisfaction to, uh, of whoever gave me the order, and then I never have to deal with it again, right? And so this relationship between finding it, renovating it, selling it, and managing under one roof, that's the, the secret sauce, so to speak. That's the trend. And then, then it becomes a matter of where do I find properties where the turnkey provider is offering them at the 1% or better performance in reasonably nice areas where you and I would be willing to live. And when you have that combination, then you also don't have to worry because not only you and I like to live there, but our tenants like to live there too. Sure. And so pandemic or not, like in my case and our client's case, we didn't miss any payment of any rent for the whole time so far. Right? And that's a, a testament to the quality of renovation, the quality of tenant and the quality and value 
of the property they get. And then it becomes a really, really passive thing. That's why I call it passive money or passive income because you don't have calls because the property managers take care of it. But if they did a good job on the property, there aren't that many calls to begin with because stuff is done by it. Well, I think it's, um, it's important to have someone like you that has sort of blazed the trail. I think my wife is a coach, so I'm an advocate of coaches and that's why I'm looking to the Tony Robbins uh, thing. Right. It's good to have someone kind of drive the ship for you and kind of let you know, don't go that way, go this way in advance because some people go and they just go the path that they've been taught and you buy a house, you go to the bank and the bank gives you a mortgage. It's possible that there's investors that have the money. So you don't have to go the regular traditional route. You can maybe go a different way. And like you said, you don't necessarily have to buy a house or invest in a house in your area. You could invest in a house in some other area. There's like investing pools. Yeah, exactly. You gotta yeah, think outside. Mean, yeah, one of the really important things in this whole um, context uh, of investing or doing something with your money is really, and I um, really advocate for that, and you find that in part two of the Mindset Manual, is that you really first need to spend some time. And I always offer my clients to do that with me. Let's really just really sit down and spend some time to identify what is your goal to get to. So if you find out, like we started out the conversation with, my goal is to get to this time freedom point and make enough passive income. That is a very different thing than somebody saying, I want to invest in something. And my goal is that that's something, whether it's stocks or read or an apartment complex or some other, whatever it may be, for that something to massively increase in value so that when that increase has happened, I can sell it and take the profit. It's a very different thing because this passive income thing to get to the time freedom point is basically the first half of the story. And oftentimes people forget it. They look at it as if it were the whole story. The first half is to get to that number, to whatever you say, my time freedom number, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 a month. But then keep in mind those 10 or 15 properties you acquire over time to get to that number they still will be and need to be there continuously because you want to make that income basically forever. And like for me, I'm saying not only that, I also want to turn that whole portfolio over to my daughter at some point and she and her kids can benefit, <coughs> excuse me, can benefit from it also for however long. Yeah. Like <coughs> right. So, so the first half is to get to the point and then the second half is to keep it going and not like in most other investment where you invest, wait for a certain amount of time and then take profit. Well, I think a lot of people, their, <laughs> their brains, the right away they think, okay, I want to get to the top of that mountain, but that's a far way to go. And I just don't have the energy to take the first step because I know I got to go all the way. But if they just go to the first step, it's pretty easy. So just getting that, I mean, financial freedom isn't that far away. If you look at your monthly expenses, you don't need to be a multimillionaire you just need right. to be a dollar over your expenses. And now you got room to breathe. And I was going to say, how do people learn about, how do they get a hold of this, uh, this mindset manual? I think that's really important for them to. Yeah, the, the easiest thing is to just go to our website, idealwealthgrower.com. And if you wait around for like 45 seconds, it pops up automatically. Or you can, <laughs> or you can go idealwealthgrower.com forward slash free. And then you're right there and you can get, uh, download it directly from there. Okay, um, I'll put that in the links. In the yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you, Brad. Very cool. Well, is there anything else that you want to share that's uh, like parting words of wisdom as a yeah, one thing, pioneer? If you don't mind, one thing, because you just said, you know, there is this analysis paralysis or this kind of like um, being afraid of the mountain. One thing that I would like to get across to your audience or to anybody who is watching and listening is that there's oftentimes a misconception when we talk about real estate, even if it's not in an expensive area, that I need a ton of money to get started. And the reality that I always uh, show, not just speak about, but actually literally show my clients with the properties that I've acquired over the last decade or so, is that it really takes anywhere between sixteen and $25,000 to get started with the first property. And when you think about that, that is kind of like not even the, the price of a car these days. Right. right. And a lot of people, as soon as they hear house, they think hundreds of thousands of dollars. But from an investment perspective, to develop passive income, it's not 
that huge amount of money, it's between, like I said, 16 to 25,000. And I can show people how to get there, even if they haven't done anything in that area before. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, we'll need to talk further, maybe do another second uh, run at this. Maybe Yeah, of course, absolutely. <laughs> It'd be fun to do a series mm -hmm. on it because, you know, I I'm just amazed at how many condos and apartments and houses and developments are still happening because people mm -hmm. are having babies. They need to have a roof over their head. But I was wondering, yeah, where absolutely. are all these coming from? How, how are they going to fill all these with people? But people are growing. <laughs> Yeah, what is oftentimes forgotten is the United States is one of the few really uh, highly developed countries where the population is still increasing every year. And uh, what people also forget is since basically the financial crisis around 2008 to 10, because of all the things that happened without going into details, the amount of inventory that has been built in that time period, the last 12 years, is a fraction of the increase in population. And if you keep doing this for 10 or 15 years, you can imagine, let's say the population increases by 10 million people per year and you're only building 2 million new uh, places, new units, even if it looks like they're popping up over, that's 8 million a year, you do that for 10 years, you're missing 80 million properties, or well, not properties, but doors basically, right? And so that deficit is also part of the reason when you go around and ask people, what was your experience with real estate recently? Everybody says, well, I couldn't believe what price I could get for my property. And it's not because the property is so awesome or anything like that. It's just such a high demand and so little inventory that people supply and demand pay those prices. Yep. And, and I, that's it why I say, it's, yeah, it's why it fluctuates, but as long as demand is high, mm -hmm. the fluctuation is relatively limited. Yeah. Right. And so I don't see unless we really were to get into a massive infrastructure boom or something like that and, and some other things that would incentivize that in the next few years we can catch up. Right. It's just, you know, when you don't do something for a decade, it's hard to, to catch up again. That's why I like my REITs. When times are good, they're buying vacation homes. When times are bad, they're buying storage lockers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's a very hands off thing. The only difference and, and like you said, this might be something for a second episode. The most, most, most investments you do, including REITs, don't allow you to finance your investment. Right. So you if you say I want to have a $10,000 part in the REIT or I want to have a $10,000 stock investment or whatever it is, you need to literally put those $10,000 in. One of the very few places, like in my case, I want to buy a hundred thousand dollar house, but I don't have to put up a hundred thousand. I only put up pennies. But there's a five to one leverage, and there are very few uh, uh, safe investments where you can do that. Yeah, you can speculate like crazy and risk the money, but a safe investment like real estate is one of the very few where you have that leverage. And people sometimes forget that because That's ultimately, you know, that I always say the cool thing is. As long as you pay the bank their due, yeah. they allow you to do five to one leverage. And what's more important, they allow you to keep 100% of the profit. Yeah. Right. So if I make $3,000 on my $20,000 investment per year out of the passive income, I can keep all of it. The bank doesn't mind as long as I pay everyone. Yeah. Right. And that's really, that is one of the big differences of how much can you leverage your input to ultimately get to an output to the end to this time freedom point faster. Yep, I'd rather invest in real estate than eight track tapes. Those are kind of obsolete. <laughs> well, although they might actually become a collector items. They now. might, the <laughs> vinyl did, yes sir. Well, they, actually- they also, that, tells, that tells people you and I have been around for a while because we still know what that is. <laughs> That's right, I remember my computer, I used to, the, with the punch tape, the computer punch tape you put through. Oh yeah, I mean, I have a whole shelf of like CDs and I kept very acutely kept one little tiny CD player. So I have at least a chance to play them. <laughs> Fascinating how time is flying. Yeah, well, thanks. Axel, this has been delightful. I would love to be able to do something else. Maybe uh, put together a series, like I said, we could do something. Yeah, hey, let there. me know. So let's uh, stay in touch and who knows, maybe I'll come down to San Diego and- uh, Yeah, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that I will be beam this up to the universe and I'll share it with you soon. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, that's it. If you want to stand, okay. we'll talk a little bit further. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dad. No, Brad.